And welcome to the second Royal Television Society, an institution of engineering and technology public lecture. I'm Tim Davey, I'm chairing tonight. And you know, when we conceived of this lecture series, our aim was to hear from some of the world's finest minds who work in the spaces that bridge cutting edge science and technology with human creativity and media. The amazing response, and we were lucky to be there last year, who's, those of us who saw Mike Lynch in full flow, suggested we were onto something. And the excitement in the room tonight speaks to the enduring appeal in my mind of public lectures in sparking our imagination. In many ways, and I really believe this, we are lucky enough to be enjoying another golden age of advancement that demands public engagement and debate. Over 200 years, it was a rather precocious Humphrey Davy that was wowing crowds and causing carriage traffic jams with sell-out lectures on the nature of human progress and scientific knowledge. Noticeably, as a friend of Coleridge, he was fascinated by the intersection of the subjective and the technical, and the possibilities, the endless possibilities, that this throws up. So tonight, at this wonderful institution, we continue that tradition with our very special speaker, Demis Hassabas. Hassabas. Demis will talk for 35 minutes or so, then he will open up for Q&A, and I'll be conducting, I'll have the lights up, and we're really up for a good old discussion with you guys. As you know, Demis is acknowledged as a world-leading thinker in the realm of AI, which in recent years has become one of the hottest topics dominating the media and the imagination of the public. You know, in my world, we ran a recent BBC survey which was looking at which jobs are at risk of computerization. We attracted 2.3 million page views, people viewing that and seeing how safe they were. Demis needs little introduction, but I have to say his achievements put even the highest achievers' CV deeply in the shade. Chess master at 13, World Games Championship winner five times running, successful poker player, particularly impressive, double first in computer science at Cambridge, a pioneering video games developer, leader of numerous important pieces of research in the field of neuroscience, notably his landmark paper on the similarities of how we shape memory and how we imagine the future was a landmark and breakthrough piece of research. And then, of course, founder of DeepMind in 2011, which was then sold to Google in 2014, with Demis becoming VP Engineering with special responsibility for AI. DeepMind has set out a goal of solving intelligence, a humble objective. Specifically, Demis has said he is involved in building something that can expect the unexpected gracefully. I think that's probably a great brief for an audience of a public lecture. Demis, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Tim, for that uh, very generous introduction. So it's a real pleasure to be here um, giving this lecture. And uh, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and its impact on the future. In fact, it could be um, the relatively near-term future. So AI is really um, the science of making machines smart. And I got into AI firstly through the medium of games. And um, games started for me with chess. As Tim said, uh, I started playing chess when I was very young at the age of four. And I think if you play chess seriously from such a young age and you're quite an introspective kid, which I was, then you start thinking a lot about how is it that your brain is coming up with these moves, these ideas, um, that allow you to play this game and win these games. Uh, and I started thinking a lot about this as I um, uh, got into my teenage years. And allied with that, um, I uh, got into computing. I actually bought my first computer, ZX Spectrum here, 48K, with some winnings from uh, a chess tournament and, uh, when I was about eight years old. And I started teaching myself how to program. And I think um, very early on, and the engineers in the audience will, I think, um, resonate with this, I sort of realized um, on an intuitive level that this uh, computers are kind of special type of machine. Um, you know, most machines like cars and planes, they allow us to, they extend our physical capabilities. You know, cars allow us to move faster than we can run, planes allow us to fly. Um, but I think computers do that, but in the realm of our minds. Um, they really extend the capabilities um, of the brain. 
And this really became clear to me when I used to write my first programs and uh, did sort of basic math calculations and other things, which um, it really struck me. You could set something running overnight uh, and then go to sleep, and then you'd wake up the next morning and your computer would have solved some problem for you um, whilst you were asleep. So this felt like a really powerful, in some ways, magical tool. So my love of computers and uh, my love of um, games obviously came together in a, in a kind of obvious way uh, in the designing of video games. And actually, this is one of the reasons I accepted to do this lecture, is I love the idea, as Tim said, of the confluence of bringing together RTS and the creative arts and the IET and sort of engineering. Um, and that's why I got into commercial video games. Um, because at the time, this is sort of like the um, early and mid-90s, um, computer games were really pushing the cutting edge of engineering and even the machines that were being built um, to run these games. So I remember the debates in the 90s about, you know, Intel was bringing out their new Pentium processors and people were sort of saying, well, how much more power do we need to run our word processors and spreadsheets? And, um, you know, that, haven't we got all the computing power we need? And actually one of the answers was that um, if we wanted more and more realistic and, and, and complex games, then we would require uh, more and more powerful computers with larger memory and things like graphics chips. So for a long while, um, games were actually driving the development of um, cutting edge hardware. And furthermore, um, the games that I used to uh, sort of design and program all involved AI as a core gameplay mechanic. So probably my best known game um, was called Theme Park, and, uh, which is some screenshots of it here. This came out in um, 94. Uh, and was very successful. And uh, it was actually the first game of its type. So the idea here was that um, you designed your own Disney World and um, thousands of little people would come in uh, to your Disney World and kind of play on your rides. And how enjoyable they thought your theme park was would um, sort of have an impact on their emotions and how happy they were. And then that fed into the economics model about um, how much you could charge them for the hamburgers and the balloons. So the better design your um, theme park was, um, the more money it made. And then that allowed you, of course, to expand the theme park further. So um, this game and actually another game called SimCity were the first sort of games that had AI as a core gameplay component uh, and really spawned a whole genre of uh, management simulation games, as they're called. And one of the reasons these games were so popular is that the AI adapted to the way um, the player played the game. So that means that every single person who played this game um, had a unique experience. Um, and uh, people used to send in, I remember, uh, into magazines, game magazines, and write into us um, say, showing um, what end state they got their theme park into. And there was all these amazing um, designs that people had created um, that we had no idea could be done, e even as the inventors of this game. Um, so that really struck a chord with me when I was around 16, 17 years old when I wrote this game. And um, thinking about, you know, maybe if I devoted my career to AI, advancing AI, um, what an incredible technology that could be. So then after having a career in, in games and running my own games companies and things, um, I then uh, went back to uh, academia to do a PhD uh, in neuroscience, which I felt was another piece of the puzzle that I needed before launching um, an effort like DeepMind. I wanted to understand a bit more about how the brain um, solved uh, tough problems like imagination and memory. And I specifically picked those topics to do my PhD on because those are things that, um, at least back in mid-2000s, uh, were, were, we were not very good at doing in computer algorithms. So I wanted to, to look at the way the brain solved some of these very, very tough problems that we didn't know yet how to imbue our machines with. And I'll come back to that uh, towards the second half of my talk. So all of these different experiences then culminated in finally in setting up DeepMind uh, in 2010. And really, um, it's been a 20-year-plus journey for me to get to this point uh, and have enough of what I thought were the basic ingredients, both on an algorithmic level, but also in terms of the founding scientific team and making those contacts um, to actually put together something like DeepMind and, um, and plausibly go after as big a mission as um, solving intelligence. So another way we look at um, uh, the company is as an Apollo program for AI, a sort of moonshot project um, that really focuses on the very ambitious long-term goals. 
And we've collected together 100, more than 100, actually nearly 150 now, of the world's top research scientists in this area. So I think DeepMind is by far now the biggest collection of machine learning um, experts anywhere in the world. And another thing we're experimenting with, of course, apart from trying to build AI, is actually new ways to organize scientific endeavor. So what we've tried to do with DeepMind is really combine the best from um, Silicon Valley startups um, together with uh, the best parts of that you find in the, in the best academic institutes like MIT, UCL, Cambridge, and so on. And see if we can fuse that into a new hybrid way of doing science, um, which is more productive um, and extremely efficient, but still allows for extreme creativity. So our mission then, as Tim said, we articulate it in a kind of two-step uh, way. So firstly, we talk about solving intelligence. Um, and we use the word solve, which is a kind of ambiguous word there, because actually what we mean, what we're interested in is, is understanding natural intelligence, um, so the human mind, but also recreating that intelligence artificially. And then step two, we want to use that technology to help us solve everything else. Now, um, you know, that might seem a little bit far-fetched, possibly a little bit fanciful to some of you, um, but we really believe, actually, that step two naturally follows on from step one if you can solve intelligence. And I hope um, by the end of this talk, uh, you know, you'll, you'll agree with this conjecture. So more prosaically, how are we going to solve intelligence? Well, what we're trying to do at DeepMind is to um, construct the world's first general purpose learning machine. And the key aspects of this are the word general and learning. So at DeepMind, we're only interested in algorithms that learn for themselves. So they learn automatically from raw experience or raw data. So they're not pre-programmed in any way. So um, what we're talking about here is autonomous learning systems. The second thing is this idea of generality. So um, what we're interested in is the same system um, actually being able to operate across a wide range of tasks and environments out of the box with no reconfiguration. So of course we have an example of such a general learning system, it's the human mind, where we're able to apply our minds to almost endless number of different tasks. Now I should say, most of AI today, although it's a huge um, buzzword right now and is very fashionable, most of it, AI is not of this type of um, uh, technology. So we call most AI actually internally at DeepMind narrow AI. And what we mean by that is um, pre-programmed AI that has been built for, in a bespoke way for one specific task. And actually most of the AI we interact with every day from Siri on your phone to self-driving cars is um, actually uh, of this pre-programmed type of AI. And what we're interested in is what we call artificial general intelligence, this idea of a general learning system. And perhaps still the most famous and clearest example I can give of this is um, the famous Deep Blue match against Garry Kasparov. Of course, this was a watershed moment in um, AI when in the late 90s, IBM's Deep Blue beat Kasparov uh, in a six-game chess match. Um, but the interesting thing is I came away from that match actually more impressed by Garry Kasparov's mind than um, the Deep Blue machine. Because, um, you know, of course it was an impressive engineering feat, but Deep Blue um, was programmed by an amazing team of programmers along with a bunch of chess grandmasters trying to distill chess knowledge into an algorithmic uh, sort of construct. And those programmers were directly programming in the sort of ideas and solutions into the machine. Um, and of course, what that meant is that Deep Blue, although it was very good at chess, it was um, no use for absolutely anything else, including strictly simpler things, um, like, for example, playing noughts and crosses, which any chess grandmaster, you could trivially teach them how to play noughts and crosses. But obviously, Deep Blue, nothing that Deep Blue knew or in its code would help it with um, even something strictly simpler like that, let alone um, uh, other kinds of domains like speaking languages or driving cars or all these other things that, of course, Gary Kasparov could do effortlessly. So um, instead of that, we think about intelligence in the framework of what's called reinforcement learning. So I'm just going to illustrate what the main basic parts of that in uh, this little cartoon diagram, because it's important for what I'm going to show next in terms of the videos of the, of, the, of the algorithms working. So you start off with your agent system um, represented by this little humanoid character. And that agent finds itself in an environment which could be virtual 
or real world. If it's real world, the agent will probably be a robot. If it's virtual, the agent will be an avatar. And the agent has some kind of goal that it's been given, to, that it's trying to achieve um, in that environment. And the agent only interacts with the environment in two ways. One is that it gets observations through its sensory apparatus, observations about the world. And we mostly use vision at the moment, but we're also looking to use other sensory modalities soon. And um, those observations are always incomplete and noisy. So you never get full information about the world, unlike, say, a game of chess, where um, it's a perfect state information. You see everything um, that's in the game world. Uh, in, in the real world, of course, um, you don't get to see all the information. And that one of the jobs of the agent system is to build a, as accurate a model as possible of the environment out there based solely on these noisy, incomplete observations. And the agent is doing this in real time. These, these observations are coming in every time step. And, it's, and the agent is continually updating uh, its model of the world based on this new evidence that it gets. And the second job of the agent is to then pick uh, what action it should take, what's the best action it can take in that particular moment in time that will guess, best get it towards its goal um, from the current situation that it finds itself in. And once it's decided what that action should be, it outputs that action, the action gets executed, and that then may drive a change in the environment which will then drive a new observation. And this um, goes round in an um, endless sort of cycle. Now, although this diagram is uh, very simple to sort of explain, actually it hides an incredible amount of complexity. So we know that um, if you could solve all the problems behind the, um, that underlie this diagram, this representation, then that would be enough for true artificial intelligence. And we know that because um, this is the way that biological systems learn, um, including humans and most mammals. Um, and in fact, in humans, it's the dopamine system that implements a form of reinforcement learning. So we, go, we went on to um, test these kinds of systems. Um, and actually, we chose to test the intelligence of our systems um, on computer games. Now, a true thinking machine, uh, we believe, would have to be embedded in a sensory motor data stream. Um, you can't have true intelligence and true thinking unless you have um, the ability to affect the world that you're in and the ability to sense that world. And, uh, and so usually, um, so this is called embodied cognition. And um, usually when people subscribe to this view of AI, they normally start working on robots, real robots, um, based in, uh, obviously, in real-world environments. But robots are very tricky to use, they're very expensive, they're very slow, and they break down. So if you talk to anyone um, who's, who's used or to try to develop on robots, you'll, you'll hear a lot of, of the work actually goes into fixing the mechanics of the robots, the motors uh, and the sensors and so on. And actually, we didn't want to be distracted by that. We wanted to focus on the intelligence algorithms themselves. So what we decided to use was um, video games in the first instance. And of course, it's a little bit to do with my background, where it came in useful here in video games, um, and use it and repurpose the games as a platform for testing the intelligence um, and the capabilities of our AI algorithms. Now, games are really good because obviously uh, you can run them in the cloud, you can run them much faster than real time, um, you can run millions of experiments in parallel, um, and it's very easy to measure progress because most games, fortunately, have game scores. So you can see very conveniently if your algorithmic tweaks are um, gaining you an advantage and whether you're heading in the right direction um, based on um, the performance in those environments. And that's something that's very important, especially for a very long-term mission like we have, um, and very ambitious mission, is to be able to break down uh, an ambitious mission into smaller chunks that are very easy to um, measure the progress on. The other key thing about games is that uh, obviously they were designed by other people and other, other engineering teams, uh, and they weren't designed specifically for AI testing. And uh, so what that means is that you have to deal with all kinds of interesting problems that you would never have dealt with uh, designed yourself as an AI designer. Um, and I think that actually makes sure that there isn't any bias in the types of problems that you apply your AI to. So one of the big problems of, in AI research that has been over the last few decades is that, generally speaking, it's the AI designers that also design the problems. 
uh, and, and subconsciously, whether you like it or not, you end up designing problems that you know your AI algorithms are well suited to. So what we started off with um, was actually Atari games from the 80s, which were really the first iconic platform that had a lot of very popular challenging games on it. And we decided to start with that. And what we did is we started with an open source emulator for Atari games, and we um, uh, uh, souped it up and made it more robust and made it run faster. And then we plugged it in our AI algorithms into this system. Now I'm going to show you a couple of videos of the AI system working. Uh, and then, but before I do that, I just wanted to explain to you what it is you're going to see. So the AI system here um, only gets the raw pixels as inputs. So it's almost as if we'd set up a video camera uh, observing the screen. And um, the only information that it gets is the raw pixels. So it doesn't know anything about uh, what it's controlling. It doesn't know um, what the aim of the game is. Um, it doesn't know how to get points. Um, all it's being told is that, it needs to, that its goal is to maximize the score. Um, everything else is learned from scratch. And then there's a, the sort of generality component comes in again, where we require a single system to play all the different games out of the box. And there's obviously dozens and dozens of very, very different Atari games. So the first video I'm going to show you is Space Invaders, probably the most iconic game um, that there, you know, there's ever been. And um, I'm going to show you sort of two parts of this video. Um, so in the beginning, as I roll the video now, you know, you'll see what the agent looks like when it first encounters this environment. Now it's controlling the rocket at the bottom of this screen. Obviously it's trying actions randomly because it has no idea what it's supposed to be doing and it loses its three lives almost immediately. <coughs> now if you leave the machine training overnight and you come back the next day, um, the, the machine now is superhuman <laughs> at, uh, at, the, at, the, at the game. So every single shot it, it fires hits something um, it'll, it, it can't be killed anymore. Um, it's, it's worked out that the pink mothership at the top of the screen is um, worth a lot of points. It does these amazingly accurate shots. And you can see that the model it's built of the world is, is extremely accurate. So those of you who played Space Invaders back in the 80s will remember that the, 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 as there's less of them, they get faster. If you just watch the last shot, you'll see that <laughs> it's sort of predicted where, um, where that, is gonna, where, where that um, Space Invader is going to end up and fires the shortest shot ahead of time. So uh, I'm going to show you a second video now, which is the game of Breakout. It's my favorite video, where I'm going to show a few more gradations of the agent getting better and more capable. Um, so in this game, the agent is controlling the, the, the pink bat and ball. And the aim of the game is to break through this um, rainbow-colored brick wall, brick by brick. So to start off with, after 100 games, um, the, the AI system has, you know, it's not very good. You can see it's missing the ball most of the time, but you can see, maybe you can convince yourself, it's starting to get the hang of the idea that it should be moving the bat towards the ball. Now, after 300 games, uh, you can see that the, the, the system has now got pretty much as good as any human can play this, and uh, almost always gets the ball back, even when it's coming back at very vertical angles. So we thought that was pretty cool, but we thought, well, what would happen if we um, left the agent running for longer and played uh, another 200 games? And then this unexpected thing happened. It discovered the optimal strategy was to dig a tunnel around the side <laughs> and send the ball um, you know, around the back of the wall. And um, you know, it's, it's doing that again with sort of superhuman accuracy in terms of um, the motor control there and, and, and that strategy. And one of the funny things is, is that uh, although the researchers on that uh, are amazing programmers and, and, and engineers, um, they're not so good at playing Atari games. So they didn't actually know about that strategy. So it's, I think, you know, an example of um, a system that you've created actually teaching you something, which is uh, quite an, a watershed moment for us. So if you're interested in that work, uh, we, this was then fully published in, in Nature on the front cover um, uh, earlier this year, and uh, we actually even released the code as well. So you can, you can have a look at that and play with that yourselves. Um, so now we're moving on to um, 3D games, uh, Go, uh, robot simulators. And of course, we are interested in robots, but as a, develop as a sort of application rather than as a development platform. Now, I'll just show you one thing on the uh, 3D stuff. Um, so we'll have a lot more announcements, new announcements to make uh, in the next year. 
Um, but we, we, I'll show this sort of run this little video of um, the same agent that you saw playing the Atari games actually now driving a racing car around a track uh, in a 3D game. So um, again, the only inputs here are the pixels, the raw pixels, uh, and the steering wheel controls. And um, it's learned just from raw experience driving the car around how to drive um, and even do things like it's overtaking the other cars at sort of 200 kilometers an hour. Um, and again, just from the raw uh, pixel data. So we're now moving towards much more advanced 3D environments uh, where we're looking at maze problems uh, and uh, all kinds of uh, much more complex uh, uh, pathfinding problems. Now, I spoke about neuroscience at the beginning of um, the talk and just want to come back and touch on that now. So we talk a lot about um, the AI that we build at DeepMind as being neuroscience inspired. And in fact, many of the um, research areas that we're looking at now, we are looking to neuroscience very closely for inspiration about, um, uh, for new types of algorithms uh, as to how the brain works. So we're looking at memory, attention, concepts, planning, um, navigation, and imagination. Now, because this is a, uh, you know, each one of those areas would probably need a whole talk to, to sort of get into. So I'm just going to focus on imagination because I think that's most relevant for the audience here. Um, and is also what I did for my PhD. Now, it turns out that imagination is quite dependent on an area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is actually here, this area in pink here, at the center of your brain uh, in, this, um, in this diagram of, of the human brain. Now, the hippocampus, it's, very important, it's, very, it's quite a small part of the brain, uh, a small brain region, but it's a very critical um, brain region. And it's been known for you know, more than 50 years now that if you damage the hippocampus, um, then you, um, you become amnesic. So it's well known that the hippocampus is vital for episodic memory. But what wasn't known was what else was the hippocampus useful for? Um, for example, was it involved with imagination. Now, um, I suspected that it might, might be because when I started reading the literature on memory and hippocampus when I started my PhD, I sort of came across this literature that was talking about memory as being a reconstructive process rather than like something like a videotape. So, uh, and that's actually the way that memory works. When you, if you remember this lecture tomorrow, it won't, it's not kind of like a stored like a videotape somewhere in your mind. Actually, you'll be combining it from all sorts of components of things and experiences that you've had before. Other lectures, um, perhaps other visits to the British Museum, as well as specific pieces of content that are to do with this evening specifically. And what your brain does and the hippocampus is involved with is reconstructing that, pulling all those parts together into a coherent whole, which then is recognized by the rest of your brain as a, actually an episodic memory. So I was thinking, well, if memory works as a reconstructive process, then um, if we think about imagination as being a similar process, but in this case, it's a constructive process. If we think of memory as trying to put your components that you have together in a way that your brain thinks, looks, uh, and judges as familiar, perhaps creativity is the, is the converse of that. You're still bringing together those components, but now you're trying to create something novel that actually your brain judges as unfamiliar. Um, so I was thinking, well, if memory is heavily dependent on the hippocampus, then maybe imagination is also uh, very heavily dependent on the same brain structure and the same processes. So the way we decided to test this was actually by getting, um, uh, going around the country uh, to interview patients who had damage to the hippocampus, but only the hippocampus. And um, there's very rare sorts of diseases that cause that. Um, although things like Alzheimer's actually do attack the hippocampus, but also other brain structures. But what we needed were patients that had only specific damage only to this one brain region. And we tested those patients on their imaginative abilities rather than um, their episodic memory. And what we did is gave them fairly a, a kind of simple imaginative task. We would give them uh, word cues like the following. Imagine you are lying on a white sandy beach in a beautiful tropical bay. Describe in as much detail as you can what you can see and hear and experience around you. And what happened was, is when we compared and broke down their descriptions, we scored it uh, in a very complex scoring system to break down how rich that description was. And we compared it to age and educated and IQ matched control subjects. So they were matched in every way, except that obviously they had um, intact and healthy hippocampuses. We found that 
um, on our richness measure or experiential index measure that the imagined scenes that the hippocampal patients were describing were hugely impoverished compared to the healthy controls. And you can see that in these two, I don't know if you can see this laser pointer, in these two um, bar charts. So on the left-hand side here is the patients, the five patients, and then here are the 10 matched controls to these patients. And you can see this is the um, sort of richness index, if you like, of the described scene. And you can see that the patients are massively um, deficient compared to, the, um, to, compared to the controls. So, um, so it seems indeed that the hippocampus is very important for imagining the future. And uh, actually, the new scientists reported on this uh, work, uh, and it became quite a big study um, that was also uh, listed in science as, a, as one of the big breakthroughs of 2007. And the new scientists had quite a nice um, headline talking about um, hippocampal patients being stuck in the present. So the idea was, you know, they, we know they can't remember the past very well, and now it turns out they can't imagine the future either. So, um, but yeah, if you were to talk to them, they seem, you know, for a few minutes, they would seem completely normal to you, and you'd be able to converse with them um, completely normally because they're processing the present um, in the same way that uh, a healthy person would. So we then, then followed this up in fMRI, and we found out, of course, the hippocampus doesn't support imagination on its own. It's part of a, it's a critical co sort of core part of a much larger brain network that includes all sorts of other brain regions, from the retrospinal to the medial frontal cortex, to the medial temporal lobe, lateral temporal cortex, and parietal cortex. So all these regions reliably come on when you scan somebody in a brain scanner and you get them to imagine scenes. Um, and and the, this network is the imagination network, if you like. So then much more recently, I was thinking, well, okay, so, th so this is how humans imagine, um, but um, what about animals? Can they imagine as well? For example, can a rat imagine? Um, uh, you know, again, we know that rats have memory, very good memory, in fact, um, but can they do things like imagine the future? So before I just um, show you the study that we did to investigate that, I just need to take you through um, a couple of things about that we know about rats um, um, and we know that rats can do. So the first thing to tell you about is play cells. Now, um, play cells, are, you can really think of them as the GPS coordinates in a rat's brain about where they are. So if we imagine a box that there, a, a rat might be in a box, so here we're looking top down on this environment, then um, the rat might be roaming around this box. And uh, you know, in these experiments, you record directly from the rat's brain while they're roaming around. And what you find is, is that um, cells in the hippocampus fire um, in specific places in the environment. So for example, a cell, cell A might fire only when the rat is um, traversing through this particular part of the box environment. Conversely, cell B might only fire in another part of the environment. Now, um, the, the amazing person who discovered this, John O'Keefe, who discovered these play cells in the 70s, just around the corner at UCL, won the Nobel Prize for this last year. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to have him as my, uh, on my Viva committee for my PhD. So I got to know him well and um, the entire rat literature very well. And what I started thinking about is, since that discovery of play cells, people have found that actually um, sequences of play cells fire in, in, in kind of sequence when a rat moves through an environment. So for example, let's take a new uh, environment here, a linear track. So this is a, like a linear box. And the rat's moving from, um, from left to right here. And what you find, if you record from the brains of these rats, is that play cells will fire in order, A, B, C, and D, depending, mimicking the way um, and matching the way that the rat is moving through that environment. And in the 90s, other people uh, found that when they recorded from the brains of these rats while they were asleep, after they had um, walked around and navigated in one of these um, maze-like environments, that the, 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 the rats would replay the trajectories they'd experienced um, in their awake session before. So you could, you could really think about this as rats dreaming. So they would replay this trajectory of A, B, C, D, but now this would be just, um, they would be sleeping soundly, and it would be just their, their brains replaying this. 
And what's interesting is that the brains of these rats actually replay these trajectories an order of magnitude um, faster than they actually experienced it in real life. So if you think about dreaming as maybe helping the rats uh, learn about the environments they're in, then um, they're, they're actually um, uh, uh, learning from this much more efficiently than they can experience it when they're awake. So that uh, shows that rats have memory and perhaps they dream, but it's not showing that they actually imagine new experiences that um, they have an experience while they're awake. So we wanted to show that unequivocally. And recently, we published a study with some colleagues of mine at UCL uh, in eLife um, that I think uh, unequivocally shows that rats do imagine. So we designed this simple but um, I think quite elegant design uh, to test this hypothesis out. So what we had here is um, a tea maze this time. So again, we're looking top down on the, on the rat environment. And the tea maze has a barrier. So um, and this barrier here stops the rat. Uh, the rat starts off in the stem of the tea maze. Um, and it stops the rat moving to the arms of the tea maze. But it's see through the barrier. So the rat can see past to the arms and see what's on the arms. So the rat is initially, in the first session, running up and down the stem of the tea maze. And what we do to make the rat really interested in the arms is we put some food, uh, a rice pellet, on one of the arms here, in, in, depicted by this yellow dot, and on the right-hand arm. And the rat can see this when it gets to the barrier, but it can't reach the uh, rice pellet. So obviously it's very motivated to think about, uh, to try and get the rice pellet, but it can't get past the barrier. So then, after it's experienced that environment for a while, we let the rat go to sleep. And we're, of course, we're recording from the rat's brain while this is going on. Um, and then we wake the rat up again, and now we put it back in the environment. But this time, um, we remove that barrier. So now it's free to run around the whole tea maze. So it does that happily. It moves around uh, the, the, the stem and the arms, both the left arm and the right arm. Uh, and it fully explores this whole environment. So obviously, as I've just told you with the play cells, what we can do is we find that there are play cells, let's say cell A and cell D, that fire um, on the arm section of the maze. Now what we can do is then go back to look at the data we collected when the rat was asleep and see if the rat was imagining about those trajectories towards the rice pellet before it ever had experienced it in reality. So don't forget, when it was sleeping, it, the rat had never experienced walking on this arm. It had only seen that arm. And what happens is, we find, our conjecture was sort of proven, that actually um, you get, we find if we go back and analyze the sleep data, you get this replay, um, or pre-play, if you like, of this trajectory, A, B, C, D. And what's more is, this is not just random pre-play, you actually get more, significantly more preplay to the right-hand arm than to the left-hand arm, which is exactly what you would expect if it's behaviorally consequential, right? So you can, I mean, of course, this is anthropomorphizing the rat, but you could imagine the rat's really wanting to get to that rice pellet and is imagining plans of how could it get there, right? Almost imagining itself walking to the rice pellet and then eating it. Uh, and so, and then it's dreaming about its imagined experiences, right? So, um, so, and that's really what's going on here, I think. Uh, and of course, we're now going to look into this further, and we have a number of plans to look at uh, follow-on studies from this um, with more complex environments. So, you know, humans imagine, rats imagine. So what about um, uh, uh, machines? So this is something that's key, imagination, to planning for the future, making plans, good plans about the future. So this is obviously something that we also want our machines to be able to do. So, um, you know, I've entitled this slide, do, do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which is, of course is a reference to Philip K. Dick's famous book and one of my, my favourite films, Blade Runner. And, um, and this is really, I'm just going to give you a very short excerpt here with this video of, which is a little bit of an insight into the mind of the machine that you saw earlier playing Space Invaders. So I told you though that one of the purposes of the agent system is to build a model of the world so it can predict the future of what's going to happen in that game world. And here, uh, what I'm going to show in this sort of 10 second video is the machine getting an initial input from space invaders, like this, this is the game position, and then freely imagining or dreaming about what might happen over the next 10 seconds. 
So you can see it's, it's dreaming about moving its, its, uh, the rocket, and it's dreaming about getting points and shooting some of the space invaders. Now, it's quite fuzzy because there's uncertainty about what might happen in the world. It's all probabilistic. So um, it's not as certain as seeing uh, an actual screen. Um, but it's the beginnings, I think, of imagination-based planning. Now, I'm just going to end by talking a little bit about, so that's imagination. So once you start thinking, well, could machines have imagination? Well, what about creativity? Now, this is something I get asked about all the time, and of course, is very relevant to a lot of the work that people in this room do. And um, you know, I think we're a long way away from uh, machines being truly creative, but I don't think it's impossible. Uh, and I think that um, when we start to understand what this process is, this mysterious process of creativity is, um, I think it will become um, actually more obvious um, how to implement that in, in an algorithm. So I just want to show a couple of little hints at things that might surprise you. Um, so let's just take um, a picture of uh, the British Museum, the front of this building. And uh, if we then uh, say to uh, the machine, and this is a new type of algorithm that was actually first uh, uh, very recently uh, invented at Max Planck Institute in Germany, and then we've implemented our own version of this internally. And what you can do is you can give it a artistic picture, like this Van Gogh picture, and say you want it to, you want the that photo redrawn in the style of Van Gogh, right? And um, and actually, so you end up with outputs that are like this, where you can actually, it's not ready yet to be hung in the Louvre. But you can sort of start thinking, it's pretty surprising when I saw these things, like how uh, uh, actually coherent the output can be. Um, and then, you know, we can look at other examples. So actually, this is a piece of concept art for um, uh, a new Google campus that's being built in, in Silicon Valley. And uh, we give it a Surat painting, and then we ask it to output it. And this is one of my favorite ones. And it, you know, it produces pretty good version of the, um, of the original, but in, in the style of Surat. And this isn't true creativity, right? In, in some sense, this is a parlor trick because what we're doing here is deconstructing the, 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 the features of both the original photo and the, um, the painting, and then we're swapping those features, uh, uh, overwriting the, the photo features with the painting features, and that gives this, uh, this, th these kinds of outputs. But the surprising thing here is that there isn't much sort of what you would regard as creativity here, and yet you get these uh, kind of very interesting outputs. So it may be that creativity isn't as mysterious as it seems to us um, when we ultimately find out what it is. Now, I'm just going to end by talking a little bit about the bigger picture um, and sort of the impact that AI might have in the future. And uh, so, you know, I think some of the big problems that are facing us um, uh, as a society are information overload and system complexity. So, you know, everywhere uh, we go now, we're deluged by information. So things like, um, obviously, genomics, big data in general, but in the world of TV, you know, entertainment. I mean, there's so many TV channels now and modes of watching things. How can you really find what it is that you're interested in? And uh, personalization is one kind of technology that might help, but it doesn't really work because it's really based at the moment on quite primitive sort of wisdom of the crowds, collaborative filtering technology. And that doesn't give you unique recommendations that are unique to your, what I would call, long tail of interests. And then in terms of system complexity, the kinds of systems we would like to master, you know, climate, disease, energy, macroeconomics, even particle physics, are becoming so complex now that even teams of the, of the best and brightest human experts um, uh, are having difficulty of comprehending the implications uh, uh, of, of these systems and actually making useful predictions about them. So I think solving intelligence, solving AI, is potentially a kind of meta solution to all these problems. If we can solve intelligence, then maybe we can use it to help us um, as human experts uh, uh, get a better handle on all these other systems. And my dream, really, the thing I'd like to use uh, general AI for is to build AI scientists or to make AI-assisted science possible. And of course, if we have something this powerful, then obviously we need to think about the ethics of that, of the use of it. And um, as with all new powerful technologies, and I think uh, AI is no different from many other technologies in the past in this regard, we have to be uh, very cognizant about using these technologies ethically and responsibly. And although human-level AI, I think, general AI is many decades away, I think we should start the debate now 
Um, and um, in, indeed, that's what we're doing, uh, both with our own internal ethics committees, but also by supporting academic work and academic conferences uh, on these topics. And then finally, with a nod to neuroscience, I think building AI uh, actually in this way, this neuroscience-inspired way, uh, help us better understand the mysteries and the workings of our own minds. And I think in, in the future, you know, I think we're on part of the journey we're on is that as we try to distill intelligence into an algorithmic construct, if we then compare that with the capabilities of the human mind, I think we'll better understand about what's unique and special about our own minds, like dreaming, creativity, and perhaps even the great consciousness question. Um, and as Feynman said, one of my all-time scientific heroes, what I cannot build, I do not truly understand. Thanks for listening. Brilliant, well done. Yeah. Take a pause. That was brilliant. Um, if we get the lights up, I'm going to ask one question, but not hog the limelight here, and I'll hand over to the audience. We're going to have 20 minutes, so um, have, a, have a little pause, have a think about what you want to ask Demis, because that probably provoked uh, in so much kind of thinking. Um, one, one question I've got, very simple one actually, is, if you do, what I was amazed by was that what you what you details your twenty year plan. You know, yep. get your chess skills sorted. <laughs> you know, in terms of those virtual environments in gaming, then then you needed the new. But that was the first twenty years, and you just talked about decades away because I think people are pretty obsessed with yep. the, taking that raw data in, building the picture of the environment. We're, we're at Atari games. Mm -hmm. By the way, I knew that breakout trick. By the way, <laughs> anyway, um, we're at Atari games, yep. and then the other end of the spectrum is the AI scientists mm -hmm. taking raw. AI. What's what's a, just give us a, a sense in in the generation you're in. Yeah. What's a realistic moon landing in your terms? What, yeah. What I mean, is it? I touched on some of those things um, in that neuroscience slide of the things, the big things I think are important to solve. That beyond mm. like the Atari games, of course, we're sort of on the first rung of the ladder there. The Atari thing was significant because it was the first time anyone built a, what we call an end-to-end -end agent. So something that took yeah, raw AI. data yeah, true and then AI. made decisions yep. and did that in one big cycle. Um, obviously, I think the next big breakthroughs will be, can it really learn abstract concepts um, and go beyond just perceptual inputs and have a real underlying understanding of the semantics of the world it finds itself in? So that's, I think, um, you know, for us is our big kind of... And five, I mean, is this going to be exponential, like the way computers developed, are we all going to be in 20 years be bowled over by the, the speed of progression? I think it's, it's hard to predict. Because we've only got one of you, and you're not right. going to be here forever. Sure. So we've got to, we've, we, I'm, I want to know how much we can get yeah. in 20 I years. I mean, so. I, think, I think it's hard to predict because, um, you know, we need at least a dozen really huge breakthroughs, and uh, I think to get all that way, and, 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 and research breakthroughs are notoriously hard to predict mm. the timescales mm. of. So I think we'll, we'll have, you know, several very surprising things over the next few years. Um, but, you know, as to how far we'll get all the way, I think it's, it's too hard to say from here, um, you know, precise timescales for that. Brilliant. I'm going to open it up because it's easy for me to, I could be here all night, but why don't we start up there, we'll get a mic to you, that gentleman there with me. <coughs> then we'll come down to the front, I don't know how many mics we've got going. Uh, Tim Marshall, <clears throat> if the squeamish will just close their ears for a second. A few weeks ago I was at a conference uh, where a robot was performing a prostate operation, uh, more than just performing the operation, it could actually understand the tumor and make a decision whether to proceed or not. Uh, today we've seen in the news the challenges of providing health care. Mm. Uh, th what role do you think AI can play in diagnosis and treatment in health? Because uh, the way we practice medicine at the moment is a 19th century paradigm. Yep. Uh, so I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's great. Actually, healthcare is actually one of the main uh, application areas we're focusing on first. I think um, we could probably revolutionise the sort of quality of the care and the efficiency of it. Um, you know, as you say, we're still using kind of 19th century methods. And uh, I think uh, having um, this sort of latest information available in a digestible, actionable way to surgeons and GPs and so on um, you know, I think will must really help that whole, uh, you know, the whole healthcare space. So it's something we're uh, looking to get heavily involved with in the next few years. Uh, why did you decide to publish the code? And were you ever worried or concerned uh, from the ethics point of view that that code might get into the wrong hands? Yeah, I mean, 
we try to be as open as possible about what we're doing. So we generally publish um, almost everything that we do. And uh, where we can, we do open source things as well. So actually our neural network library is called Torch that we um, build our algorithms on top of. That, that's open source. And uh, we felt, uh, and there was a demand for some of the uh, nature reviewers and editors that um, you know, it'd be nice if we could release our code. So we thought about it and we decided in that case um, that was fine. Um, but uh, you know, that, that may not always be the case for the stuff we do. Uh, and we'll obviously have to consider that on a case-by-case -case basis. But in general, where we can, we like to engage and support the general academic community. And we think it's important that knowledge is shared. And I think that's the way that um, humanity can advance um, as quickly as possible. In the second row, yeah. then. You're, then you're one of the largest brains on the planet. And um, Google Thank has you. now bought you. <laughs> and um, I'm going to ask you that question, which I'm sure you're expecting. Um, uh, the, you know, the Stephen Hawking thing, that mm. the, the concern about AI, that um, once you let the genie out of the bottle, um, we're all fucked. Right. <laughs> yes. and, so, um, and can, so you, can you make it What are you doing to try and put I mean, some we, safeguards we in there? Go for yeah. it, Dennis. This is, a, this is a regular media Yes, sure. Challenge, I mean, it? look, I, I've actually spoken, um, uh, I had a long chat with Stephen Hawking about this, uh, you know, a few months ago. <laughs> and um, I think Who won he was. That debate? Well, he was, I think he, it was very enjoyable. And I think he, he we spent hours together. We only spent mm. half, half an hour, but he, was, he had so many questions. And I think he was quite reassured after we talked about how we were, we specifically were approaching it. Um, and I think, look, you know, there are big, big issues here, very big issues about um, autonomous learning systems, what goals should we give them, what value systems should we give them, how can we make sure that those are exactly what we want. And there are very tough pieces of research that need to be done. Um, there hasn't been much work done in that area yet, partly because there have been no systems to really mm. try this out on. So it's all been thought experiments. And I think if you do, you know, mostly the people thinking about this and worrying about this to that extent are not in the AI field, right? They're either philosophers or they're other very um, famous scientists or, or industrialists, but not actually working on AI themselves. And if they were working, I think they would see that the problems are much more prosaic at the moment. Uh, and it's easy, I think, to get carried away with science fiction scenarios that are you know, many decades away. My, I have confidence that um, as we get build more powerful systems, we'll have much better ideas about answers to these questions um, that I've just talked about, value systems and so on. Uh, and um, you know, mathematical proofs of it, empirical work that will um, allow us to have a much better idea of how to keep these systems under control. Well, I'm pleased to see that you've got the um, the ethics committee there yep. on board, and you're thinking about these issued issues. But you have taken the Yankee dollar, and um, I am worried about this because you're so smart, and I hope that everything you do actually improves the society rather than kills us off. Well, so do I. But uh, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, I, I think AI, you know, could be the greatest thing for humanity in the sense of if we build it right will solve all these big issues that just, disease... Just that point, Dennis, about science. corporate responsibility, but yes. corp corporate responsibility yeah, versus sure. your I mean, own I, yes. personal ethics, yeah. which shine through. I think the bigger, we, that's yeah. a big one, isn't it, in terms of yeah. where power lies in society? Sure. I mean, I should probably make, you know, say a little bit about that. So, obviously, we spent a long time doing due diligence ourselves on Google, right? And we had a lot of other options, including stay independent. Mm. And we decided to join forces with them, partly because the people high up at Google agreed with things like the Ethics Committee and thought it was a good idea that governed the use of the technology of DeepMind's technology. We've already out ruled out things, obvious things, like military or intelligence applications. Um, so, you know, de by default, DeepMind stuff doesn't, cannot be used for those things. And then, obviously, we, you know, we've had our inaugural uh, meeting of the committee, ethics committee. There are very big uh, luminaries on that, many of whom are some of the people that you've mentioned who are worried about this stuff, not just the people who think positively about it. And uh, a big part of that, actually, because you know, we are decades away, is to just start educating mm. everyone on what the real issues are and separate sort of fact from science fiction. Um, and I think that's the first starting point. And then we can actually get to the hub of the really core technical difficult questions there are. Um, and there are some, but I, I'm very confident if we apply enough brain power onto it with enough time, uh, we'll solve those problems. Great. We'll go Hi. Um, you, you, you've been in Google now for about a year. Um, can, you, can you give us a couple of examples or, or anecdotes about how DeepMind has changed the company 
um, taken over some processes, changed the way the company works yeah. sure. uh, going forward. Well, and just uh, to tag onto the ethics committee, why haven't you publicized or published who's, who's on it? So um, first question is, I'm pleased to say almost nothing's changed. And that's the whole point of it. That was one of the main agreements. So it's we, our, you know, our headquarters is still in the UK, in, in King, around King's Cross. We've built, invested in the research team there. So the whole of DeepMind is still UK side. And uh, you know, we're very into, we work as a kind of semi-autonomous type of unit. The plus sides are the amount of compute power obviously we have access to uh, has really accelerated our progress and obviously the other resources that Google I'm sorry, has. I meant the other way around. How has DeepMind affected Google as a company? Oh, I see. Um, well, so um, that's harder to say. I mean, Google's very big. Um, but I think that we have actually uh, affected it in some senses uh, uh, the way that some other parts of Google research do their work. So there's actually thousands of people in Google research and there's thousands of people working on machine learning. Um, but we, we sort of have a more coherent, uh, specific mission than uh, the more applied machine learning that gets mm. done elsewhere in Google. So I think we bring, we bring together a kind of longer term research focus that um, I think maybe Google wants more of now. Uh, and that requires quite different organizational structures uh, and management processes, which um, you know, some, of, uh, some of which is being adopted over in Mountain View and Silicon Valley now. Um, so your second question uh, was about the why don't we publicize stuff. Well, firstly, um, uh, uh, you know, the, it, we're very early days and uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on this. And um, there's nothing, I at the moment, it's about simply about educating people, uh, ev getting everyone up to speed with the issues. Um, once you start making things public, then immediately that changes, that can change the debate. And I wanted um, to have a period of um, sort of quiet, behind the scenes, uh, calm, calm collector debate before we additionally brought on ourselves this uh, additional sort of public scrutiny. So at some point, I think we will announce who uh, you know, these people are and also a little bit about what the issues are that are being discussed. Having said that, we already do lots of public things. So um, there was a big uh, conference in Puerto Rico that was talking about AI uh, ethics and safety. There's another one at U New York University in January that we're sponsoring and I'm keynoting and I'm on a program committee of, along with Facebook, uh, the heads of AI is there and Microsoft and some of the other companies. So I think probably the next stage next year would be to create a cross industry panel um, and bring together all the big companies and academic labs that are working on this, in addition to our own internal committee. Okay, let's, let's crack through a few more. We've got about 10 minutes. So I think someone's got a mic here, though, and then we'll okay. go up to the gentleman there. Thank you. Yes, that was a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much for that. Um, I uh, was an engineer. I'm now a slightly aged academic. Um, we work on, uh, we've done general uh, video gaming machines, um, so I appreciate that very much. But when you go the next stage up to imagination, there, there must be so many individual random coordinates, if you like, because I think we all imagine differently, mm. um, that you, you'll spend in an infinite amount of time trying to analyze these to actually make machines, if you like, imagine in planned fashion. So how do you, how do you cope with this, these coordinates you can't I mean, I'd, I'd build understand. that as well, because a lot of the audience, and for the television audience here, I can see, and I suspect there was a bit of a shudder around, he's kidding, he's the creative... Sure. bit which is yeah that's a bit clunky which sure. you admit you know kind of, of merging the bits versus you know when the first director yeah. comes oh, when the yeah. first writer comes, when those the the points in the environment the choices become that's right. I mean, exponential I think versus a space invaders it, exactly it's like the the, the rice right. on the chessboard so, you know, yeah. The, yeah so i think uh, i think most people's jobs in here are safe for a long yeah, time ceo is quite hard uh, so i was I so relieved think, i don't think was, uh, there's going to be any directors you know directing something you know the quality of ridley scott or something for right. you know that's probably going to be one of the if if ever one of the last things that that computers will be able to do so we are talking about very constrained things where um, you know, that's a very difficult thing that humans, of course, do better than, than, way better than computers is we, you know, they can have this rudimentary kind of brute force imagination, but um, one of the big things that humans do is, is they have aesthetic judgment, right? They know that um, not all paths are equal. And, and some of them are likely to be more fruitful than others. Even if you compare chess grandmaster playing 
a chess compared to a computer, they, they, you know, a computer might look at millions of moves to make that one decision, mm -hmm. whereas a chess grandmaster only look at a few hundred, but judicial ones. And they, mm -hmm. in some sense, our brains even filter out uh, our low-level part of our brain or any of the kind of moves or trajectories that are not going to yield anything useful. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, can you do that filtrate? Are you working on making? Well, we are. I mean, working part, on that filtration. Well, part process. of that is is to do with how well you model the world that you're in. So if you're better at modeling the world, then what that means is you should make better predictions about um, what are going to be useful things to spend your compute time uh, uh, imagining or thinking about. Uh, and at the moment, we, you know, we're still very early stages of that. Mm, very interesting. David. Hi, uh, David Abraham from Channel 4. Um, you touched on <clears throat> the challenge of um, how many choices uh, people have in entertainment. And, um, something that we in our industry are spending a lot of time thinking about. Um, are, are you um, working more specifically on the area of recommendation mm -hmm. engines and are you um, going to be, as it were, capturing the power of that uh, algorithm on behalf of Google? Yeah, we are looking at recommendation systems and, um, you know, uh, in all forms actually, all sorts of forms. And uh, I think it's a very interesting area, and it's uh, something that our technology is quite are quite sort of applicable to. Um, again, it's about you know can you model uh, user journeys and trajectories through things, and in a way that um, you know then delivers much more compelling content or recommendations. And I think uh, you know the current systems we have are not good enough, um, and you know we're, we're experimenting that again we don't we're, we're quite early days with that and we're looking at that for things both internally at google and external um uh, partners so you do see things. external because i think that'll be deeply intriguing to yep. a number of us in the room who are working in the media business about how to serve up stuff in a world where choices yes. exploded yeah exactly and the general application of that is a few years you know you think you'll be announcing stuff products coming i think in, maybe that might be the wrong word forgive my yeah. ignorance but systems by which the likes of Channel 4, the BBC, other broadcasts in the room, independent companies can serve their content up. You think that's not far away, do you? Yeah, I think in the next couple of years, you'll start seeing under the hood uh, uh, algorithms helping the, these kinds of recommendation systems. And then maybe four or five years out, actual totally new systems that uh, you might interact with in a different way to we do now. Fascinating. Yeah. Right, we've probably got, we're coming towards the last few, but we'll get through as many as I can. Uh, hi, Daniel Tool from IBM. Um, I think we're one of the other big investors in AI, and, and I liked your comments around the big breakthroughs. It probably takes more than one player to get us to, to the future space. Um, I had a couple of questions that intrigued me in, in your talk. Uh, one was Go. So, so years ago, I think there was a big effort around Go, and it was, it was the big one that was hard for computers to solve. It might be a bit esoteric for this audience. Um, and then the second question, just to bring us to the point, is um, uh, for RTS, how can... AI be used not to supplant creativity, but to enhance and support it and, and, and allow us to do more creative things as humans, not as computers. Okay. Just do a quick one on the first one, because you might want to do that afterwards if it's really... Yeah, so, so, Go, so Go, for those of you who don't know, is, a, is an oriental board game, which is probably the most complex game there is. It's, it's what they play in China and Japan instead of, uh, and Korea instead of chess. And um, one reason it's been so hard for computers to crack is that the branching factor, the number of choices you have um, in each move is the order of 100, whereas in chess it's more like 20. So as you start planning, that branching factor explodes. So if you're going to do it in a brute force way, there aren't enough, I think, atoms in the universe to describe yeah. how many Go positions there are, for example. Are you, you're, um, I bet you're good at Go, aren't you? I'm reasonably good at Go. Were, yeah. you, world so, no. Were you world champion at Go? No, I wasn't well. world champion at no. Go. Yeah. But, 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 um, and yeah. then the second problem is that uh, in chess, because chess is a very materialistic game, so the queen is worth more than a rook and so on, it's quite easy to hand program an evaluation function to tell you whether your program is winning or losing or how well it's doing in that position. Whereas in Go, all the pieces are worth the same. They're just, there's just one piece. And so whether you're winning or not is much more about the overall pattern of the board. So it's a much more beautiful game in some sense, very aesthetically pleasing. Um, but it's much harder to hand code an evaluation function. So um, yeah, we, we have, we're gonna have some very big announcements to make on Go. I mean, it's sort of been the holy grail for the AI research right. communities for the last 20 years since Deep Blue actually beat Kasparov. Um, sorry? Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, and then so then then the the the, the last question was on. Uh, 
Oh, helping create. So, yeah. so, in, so that's, for so this that's, audience, so that's really so that's really the same thing I'm thinking about in science too, right? Yeah. And and with doctors and with what I'm really thinking about is AI surfacing the right information for you for you in a much more right. digestible way, so you can just leverage that for whatever it so is. In the world of media, I mean, we talk the recommendation area. Yeah. Is there anything else in your head you might that springs to mind in terms of the creative process, the creation mm -hmm. of media? I think that's a lot tougher. So I think recommendation is the obvious one. Um, we are looking at things like music, which is no, uh, a, a kind of more constrained domain for a computer than visuals, I mean, which is incredibly mm. hard, right? And uh, there's some very interesting work being done in music, music composition, uh, music analysis, uh, uh, which I think is pretty promising. So I would imagine that would be the next place. Very good. I'm going to take three more because we're really running out of time. I'm sorry, because we could just keep going all night here. Take gentleman here. Has anyone got a microphone on them? Because, no, we'll, we'll just get the mics to the gentleman here. Anyone at the back want to have a, because I've been very front focused. Uh, we'll take the gentleman on the end of the row right at the back there. Hi, Nicola Rosa from IBM. Um, we've been shaped from the search of pain and pleasure during our all cultural history. And it's shaped the way that we are thinking and the way that we are behaving. How can you teach uh, pain and pleasure to a machine? Well, one question is whether we, whether we need to, um, but also, or whether we should. And, um, but there is sort of, this speaks to this idea actually that we, we look at internally of um, intrinsic motivation, we call it. So, you know, there are emotions and other things that drive human behavior, not just external rewards. Um, so, uh, you know, and at the moment our machines don't have anything like that, but um, maybe to do more complex tasks, or, you know, we're at the moment we're working in game worlds where there is conveniently a score most of the time. But even if you start going to more complex games or open-ended things like Minecraft, now there isn't a score anymore, right? So how are you going to decide what you should do, what is, what's useful, what's good, that you're making progress? And I'm talking about the agent system here. So, um, and of course, that's more like the real world for us as, as humans. And yet somehow we have our own internal drives probably that have been evolved to uh, that help uh, influence our behavior. So it, I think it's interesting to think about, um, and you know, we have neuroscientists who are experts in these areas who work with us as consultants, and it's something I'm very fascinated by. Um, but uh, you know, we don't have a definite answer on that yet. Thank you. Right, two more. So we'll check the gentleman at the back, I think he's, someone still want a question at the back? Have I got a hand up there? Yes, there up he is, there. right yeah. at the back there, I just feel. And then we'll take the gentleman in the red as the last question. No pressure. My, my question leads on quite well from the last, actually. I was thinking, have you thought about generalizing the goals? So you talked about how the, the, you have uh, uh, observations and you have um, actions which you take, but presumably you define the goal and you tell the system how to measure its goals. And if we're thinking about AI as something which is a servant to, to uh, human intelligence, then have you thought about AI which can derive its goals from the environment? Mm -hmm. can, can also, and also as humans, we, we segment our goals. We might have life goals, but we focus on sub-goals to get yep. there. And also, um, not just, you know, I'm sort of imagining a, a human saying to a system, can you help me with this? And, that, and the uh, AI being able to derive its goal from the uh, things that it hears, yep. but also going further than that, being able to derive goals before they're specifically instructed. Yep. So um, being able to anticipate goals that right. people might want out of AI. So, so generalizing the goals. To get a high school. That's right. I mean, that's very, you know, that's a great question. And actually, mm. it's a fascinating research area is can the machines learn their own goals uh, but through observation of, you know, learn what it is you like through observing you, for example, right? And then trying to, you know, maybe even be able to preemptively guess what it is that you need um, before you even ask for it. Um, so I think, uh, you know, those systems are very interesting. I mean, even there, you would still have some kind of top level goal, which is to satisfy the user, right? Uh, although it may learn what the sub goals are. And that's another very active area of research is uh, how do you break down a large goal into, into automatically into sub goals? And of course, that's something our minds do effortlessly. You know, if you're going to plan to, um, you know, a trip to Paris from here, um, your brain is not going to plan over your muscle fiber movements all the way from here to Paris, right? It's, but the, yet that's how robotics works at the moment, mm. right? They mm. have no Fascinating. defining of hierarchy. What your brain's actually going to do is like, you know, at a high level, you need to get to the Eurostar terminal mm. and then take a train there and so on. And then only at the point where you get up off that chair 
does your brain then go and unpack the muscle fiber movement of get, you know, get up off a chair and, uh, and walk. So um, whereas at the moment, because we haven't solved this problem of automatically uh, generating sub goals, um, a robot, for example, trying to do that task would have to plan over the primitive action movements all the way to Paris. And of course, this is not feasible and therefore not tractable. Um, because it ends up becoming, mm. you know, speaks to the other gentleman's question about, you imagine all those paths from here on muscle, muscle fiber movements, there's an inf you know, there's basically an infinite number of them. So, um, so we need, that's one of the key things we need to solve is the sub goal problem. Is that the last question? Oh, from the mic, sorry. Just get that across. Malcolm Harrell, broadcast engineer. Following on from an earlier one and your list of memory, navigation, imagination, etc., you didn't have emotions. And as we're going to be dealing with and interacting yeah. with humans, how explosive is that with your conflicts of ethics and parameters? Yeah, I mean, again, this, this um, relates to the question of the gentleman down here about um, emotions. We, we currently, um, uh, you know, there is no equivalent of that in our systems. Um, but uh, if you think of in, in, in emotions, and probably this is too simplistic, but part of emotions are internal drives, uh, uh, give us internal drives, then that's something we do need to explore um, and uh, try and work out what ones might be needed. And it might be we need similar ones so that these systems can empathize with humans. Mm. Um, you know, obviously, there's a great Channel 4 series. I think the people, some people in the audience of you know, humans, which I really love. And that, that's interesting. You know, they're trying to empathize with the humans that they serve. Alternatively, you might want to have systems that have no, uh, a very different types of drives that help them um, be complementary to what humans are good at. So I could imagine we might need um, both types of AI. So emotion, just want to finish on the, the, the you think it's essential that you're going to have to cope with emotion as a driver of, if you like, the I response. think some types of emotions. So there's two reasons you might want them. One is so that we can, they can, these systems can empathise and work better hand in hand with humans. Yep. Uh, and the other thing is if they, it turns out the environments they're in, there aren't many external reward signals. They have to have some internal drive to get them going in the right direction. Brilliant. Um, it was a privilege. I'm going to hand to Naomi Clymer from uh, the IET, the president of the IET, in a second. But Demis, it's been wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Demis. As the president of the IET, uh, we're absolutely delighted to have co-hosted this lecture with the Royal Television Society and delighted to have someone of your extraordinary calibre, Demis. Um, events like today fulfil part of the IET's charitable remit, which is to inspire, inform and influence people. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, you sure as hell have inspired, informed and influenced me on a topic that I believe is going to change the world. Uh, I love the idea that your AI journey started with games and that machine learning uh, is done through play pretty much the same as it is for humans. Um, I, I've enjoyed the way that you've made it all sound pretty straightforward, actually, uh, from our hippocampus to imagining rats um, to the quest for machine creativity. Uh, and it just sounded quite logical that your journey to the, to the point two of your mission, which is use AI to solve everything else, uh, seems quite reasonable, um, your quest for the AI scientist to really tackle some of those big, important challenges. So listening to you, it all sounds incredibly real and feasible that AI can make a positive difference to humanity, um, and even if it's not going to be directing in any movies anytime soon. So uh, once again, please join me in thanking Demis Hassabis, founder of DeepMind, for an absolutely fantastic lecture. <laughs> And uh, I would also like to, like to thank our feisty chair, um, who did an excellent job, Tim Davey, the CEO of BBC Worldwide. Uh, I think we've all been inspired, informed and influenced, so uh, it's been very nice for me to be part of this. Thank you very much for coming. You'll be delighted to hear that drinks are now served outside. Thank you. Thank you.